is to Arizona for homeowners and hikers. So um, I can just kind of copy and paste this around if I need to, instead of if I'm not able to actually give the presentation. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Does everybody see the presentation screen? Very well, let me try this. Is that better? Am I a little louder? Good? Okay. So thank you for uh, joining. Um, this presentation will probably run about an hour, hour and 20, maybe a little bit longer, depending on things. I do have some questions that uh, people had sent to me. Um, where did I put the... Off to a great start here. Um, here it is. So I'll answer some of those, but if you have any questions, there is a Q&A box in Zoom that you can leave your questions in and I will answer them uh, at the end of the presentation. Or if I see it, I will be able to kind of incorporate into the, um, into the uh, presentation itself. So. There we go. So my name is Brian Hughes. And I own a business in town called Rattlesnake Solutions. Um, obviously, there's a lot of rattlesnakes in Phoenix and Tucson. So when people get a snake in their yards, um, my organization is one of the ones that are called to go in and get it. So uh, each year between Phoenix and Tucson, we relocate around, around uh, 15 to 1,600 snakes is how many we're going to be doing this year between these two cities. Um, that puts us in uh, um, contact with a lot of rattlesnakes, obviously. Uh, and also, in addition to doing that, we are out and about all the time, um, catching rattlesnakes, looking for them in the wild, uh, researching them, uh, keeping captive rattlesnakes. So this is why I get to speak about this um, with some authority is that every day of my life, I get to see rattlesnakes up close. When a rattlesnake is striking at me or rattling at me, or if I see one, it's going to look very different to me than it might be to somebody who doesn't have that experience very often. So that is why we're talking about this today. And obviously if you live here in Arizona and you hike here, we have probably a good mix of people that are hiking and homeowners um, and just people that are generally outside campers that see these things. This is uh, what the situation is. There are homes and snakes and hikers and people that love wildlife and hate wildlife all together in the same places. And that is not gonna be going away. Arizona is one of the fastest growing states in the country. And each time that a new development comes in, it puts a new little block of wildlife in conflict with those people. So if you are really scared of snakes, um, Arizona is probably not your, probably not the best place for you to end up because we have a lot of them here. We have a lot of different types of habitat and each one of those little separations in the way that habitat is used is gonna be occupied by a different species of rattlesnake. So in the state, we have 13 species. Uh, you may also see 15 and 18 out there in literature or in articles. All of those are acceptable answers depending on how you feel about a certain, a few certain papers. But the one thing that is true all the time is that Arizona has far more rattlesnake species than any other state uh, by far. So you might have friends that are from Texas or Florida that you know talk about how many snakes they see. Um, Compared to Arizona, uh, it just doesn't, doesn't hold a candle. Uh, Arizona has more rattlesnakes than any other state, including just the metro areas. So in the Phoenix metro area and the Tucson metro area, there are 16 or there are six different species of rattlesnake that you can find just in those areas. Oftentimes, multiple species in the same location. So if you go hiking on South Mountain, um, you can see five species that are there. Um, all in the same area. You know, they use the area a little bit differently, but you can see multiple species in a certain area. So having more rattlesnakes in uh, those places where people hike, in addition to being so fast, such a fast growing state means that there's a lot of interaction. If you are coming here from a Facebook page, you are, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, every day there's people seeing rattlesnakes out there. And I'm gonna kind of ask before we get too much further here, um, you know, we're going to go through some identification of stuff. Um, a lot of these things are things that you may think you know or may have heard before. But I'm going to ask everybody, even the people that grew up in Arizona, okay, you may have lots of rattlesnake experience. You might have be hiking here and see, you know, one or two a week even when you're out here. Um, 
take everything that you know about snakes and everything that you've heard about rattlesnakes, including things you've heard from people that you trust, things you've heard on, from the news, uh, and even experiences you've had yourself, and kind of put it all together and put it aside for a little bit, because some of the things that we're going to talk about are going to directly challenge some of those things that you've heard and maybe even some of those things that you um, have experienced. Um, a very useful thing before we go into this is just to mention the reality is that our brains are not good <laughs> at a lot of things. Our brain's job is not to teach us, give us accurate information. It is to keep us alive. And sometimes it will warp reality in order to do that. So if you're looking at this right now and thinking, well, not my brain, my brain's perfect. I'm not going to have any problems with warp perception because I, I know what I'm doing. Go look at an optical illusion. That is, you can stare at it and you can know that it's tricking you, but an optical illusion is what happens when the world that is presented to you is different than is preferred and your brain just kind of fills things in to make up some gaps. So that will help explain some of these things I'm, I might say that um, are different than your experiences and what you might have heard. So we're going to just cruise through um, some of these, the snakes you might see here. We're not going to go through all 13 species here. That's a much too long presentation for another day. We're just going to go through the ones that um, you can actually see here when you're hiking and see them pretty regularly. So if you're here, um, this Western Diamondback is the biggest thing you're going to see. It's the most common snake that you're going to see in the area, not just the most common rattlesnake. It's the most common snake that people see here. Part of that is just because they're big, they're generalist, so they can show up anywhere. Uh, they can really make use of a lot of different situations that other specialized rattlesnake species can't. Uh, so that means they can live on a golf course, but they can also live on the top of a mountain and everywhere in between, including our yards. They're also big and very detectable. I mean, they rattle, it's really loud. Um, you know, they, their pattern does a pretty good job of, of hiding them, but not as well as some of the specialized species. So they're a little easier to see in a lot of cases. And they also do things like this. So this defensive posture that you normally see only in, a, well, you, you might see it in real life, but you know, if you're driving to Tucson, there's that gas station that sells those bad Taxidermy statues of rattlesnakes are all standing up with their mouth open like this. Um, you know, they're good at this. So they're big, showy, charismatic snakes, and people see them now. Um, when I see them, I mostly see them like this, curled up in ambush or hiding, not making a peep. Okay. So this is going to be different than a lot of perceptions that people have about snakes, where they see the majority of them rattling or making sounds or um, doing things they don't expect. So we'll talk more about that later if we get this identification section. So if you hike at Paestua Peak, <clears throat> you've seen these guys. These are speckled rattlesnakes. And a lot of the mountains around here have speckled rattlesnakes. These guys, unlike the diamondbacks, are just masters of camouflage. Every mountain where they live is going to have a little different variation to that color. Um, so that in some areas like this and on Paestua, they're like that orange color or red. Um, but in other areas where the rocks are different, they might look different. Like this one, you know, uh, no offense to this one, it's up from near Peoria where the rocks aren't super pretty. So the snake isn't all that pretty. But in other areas where the rocks have brilliant oranges and pinks from copper and oxidation of the rocks, um, the, that orange and yellow color can just really pop out of there. And then this snake is the most common snake on South Mountain, the most common rattlesnake on South Mountain. It's called, it's still a speckled rattlesnake, but it looks entirely different. And you can see exactly here why um, people who um, may hike there every day or live there for 20 years and then finally see this blue gray rattlesnake on the trail um, think that it's some kind of weird exotic animal. They don't realize how many of these rocks they're walking right past every day. And in other areas, the snake can be almost invisible. This is not a mutation or, or a morph or some artificially created thing like an albino that someone's bred. This is how this snake looks in this environment. So it can be very difficult to tell that it's there. They're often confused with this snake. This is a tiger rattlesnake. And they look kind of similar, but there's an interesting thing where a lot of this presentation is gonna be about our, our minds and our culture, right? So here's, here's the first instance of that, is that tiger rattlesnakes and speckled rattlesnakes are often interchanged when people are looking and trying to identify them. But there's a strong bias that we've noticed towards things to be a tiger rattlesnake. So in a logical order, people see a snake that has bands on it. And they don't know what it is. And for some reason, people tend to choose tiger rattlesnake until proven otherwise, instead of the other way around. And I've thought about that a lot, about why people want to see tiger rattlesnakes apparently so much. And, you know, I have, I have some work to prove this, but I really think it's just because tiger rattlesnake sounds cooler. 
it's a cooler sounding snake than a speckled rattlesnake. And that might be all that's needed to flip somebody's logical process when they're trying to determine what something is to the wrong answer. I'll give you some more examples of that later on too. Tiger rattlesnakes are very common throughout Phoenix. Most people don't see them. Uh, they are a little more secretive than the speckled rattlesnakes. They have this little tiny head. If you can see that, that's one of the ways that you can tell what it is because they have this really kind of silly little head that's almost the same size as its rattle. Uh, looks like they've been put together backwards. This is a black-tailed rattlesnake. It's common on South Mountain uh, and any of the mountain parks around here, except for the ones in the middle of the city that are missing there for some reason. In this area, they're kind of a drab orange, or not orange, but green or, or, or uh, olive color. Uh, down near Tucson, they can be a little bit more colorful. They are large rattlesnakes. They are pretty easy going typically, and they're very, very commonly seen by hikers. But most hikers are never gonna know that because hikers and a lot of people that are here, even people that grew up here um, that live on a mountain and see green rattlesnakes routinely. What do you think they call them? Uh, Mojave rattlesnakes. Mojave rattlesnakes are sometimes green, but they are also famous. So that logical process used to identify snakes comes into play again, where there are people that have seen Mojave rattlesnakes their entire life, never heard of a black-tailed rattlesnake and don't know the difference that don't know that they've been looking at black-tailed rattlesnakes the entire time and may have never even seen a Mojave rattlesnake. This is an actual Mojave rattlesnake. This one is actually even kind of greenish, right? Um, some are green, some are not. A lot of them in this area around Phoenix are kind of a tan color or a straw color. So a Mojave and a Mojave green rattlesnake are both common names for the same animal. There's no such thing as a different Mojave green. And this is the first time I'm gonna ask you to take the things that you have heard and set them aside, the Mojave rattlesnake is not going to act meaningfully different to you than other types of rattlesnakes. So if you believe that all rattlesnakes are fine, but a Mojave rattlesnake, if you see that, watch out for that one, because that one's gonna chase you. It doesn't, it's not true. I see lots of Mojave rattlesnakes. I have a Mojave rattlesnake right there and one over there, and I see, see them all the time. Um, when you look at it without that expectation of what you expect it to do, what you perceive it's going to do, then what you're left with can be very different. If you look at all snakes and they're acting the same and some of them are rattling and some aren't and some strike and some don't, if you look at some of them with the expectation that those behaviors are an aggressive type action, other ones, it's a defensive ones, then you might be left with two different experiences based on those snakes. And a lot of those snakes that people see that they have claimed have chased them because they're Mojave greens happened in mountains which means that it wasn't a Mojave rattlesnake at all. It was black-tailed rattlesnake. So our brains do not do well when we are trying to differentiate between things that we're scared of. Um, they live in areas where people tend to not see them very often too. So they live in the same places that sidewinders do. Uh, flat, sandy areas. You can find them in some, some low hillsides sometimes, but they, for the most part, they live in flat, sandy uh, creosote plains, flood plains, that kind of thing. Those are not the places that we hike. We hike in mountains. So if you hike in mountains or if you're in terrain anywhere that could be described loosely as mountainous and you see a greenish snake there, you're not looking at a Mojave, you are looking at a black-tailed rattlesnake and sidewinders too. Same thing, this type of habitat that you're seeing behind them, that is the type of habitat that is uh, that they live in and Mojave rattlesnakes are very common in. Sidewinders are a type of rattlesnake. Sometimes it's confusing because there's also a sidewinder that lives in the Middle East and those sandy environments, also called a sidewinder. Um, they are not related. That's an example of something called convergent evolution, where two completely, entirely different, unrelated animals have evolved the same solution to a common problem. That problem is living on hot sand. So when they're moving in that sidewinding motion, they're essentially tiptoeing over the sand so that only two points of the body are touching the sand at any given time and they can move across it without burning themselves. But here they are small rattlesnakes. They get to maybe two feet long as a really, really big one. Most of them are smaller. Most people will not see them for the same reason that they don't see Mojave's is because they uh, live in flat sandy areas. If you live there though, if you live out near Tonopah, if you live uh, north and uh, west of Marana, if you live in those types of places around Casa Grande, you know, some parts of Peoria, then you could run into one. You could get one at your yard. You get a few of them here, but not as often as other, other species. They have these little cool horns over their eyes too. I like them. Um, out of the valley, this is an Arizona black rattlesnake. 
The locals here might call them timber rattlesnakes. Um, timber rattlesnakes are an entirely different thing that live on the other side of the country. There are no timber rattlesnakes here. But if you tell me that you saw a timber rattlesnake, I know what you're talking about. It's just not, you know, if you're wanting to be accurate, um, it's definitely not a timber rattlesnake. Um, but, you know, we know what it is. Uh, black rattlesnakes live if you're if, if in the woodland or higher elevations. Uh, doesn't necessarily have to have a lot of trees, just kind of higher elevations than a lot of the other snakes. If you are seeing dark rattlesnakes when you're hiking and camping around Prescott or Payson, um, you know, all the places that everybody that hikes is going to go as soon as the temperature starts getting into the triple digits, this is the guy that you're seeing. They're pretty easy going. It's kind of strange. Every local place thinks that their rattlesnakes are the most aggressive and the worst ones. So, you know, if you ask someone down here, the Mojave is the most aggressive. And if you ask somebody in the southeastern United States, the you know, no rattlesnakes are aggressive, but cotton mouths will come chase after you and attack your, your vehicles. And, uh, and if you are from Payson, you're going to hear some of the locals say that Arizona black rattlesnakes will hunt you down. Um, none of it's true. They're, they're actually really easygoing snakes. Most of the times that I see them, they're just kind of crawling around, rarely, really rattled at them by them. Uh, this is a comparison as to what an actual timber rattlesnake looks like compared to an Arizona black rattlesnake. The timber's on the top, Arizona black's on the bottom. Uh, you can be forgiven for seeing these things as the same animal, especially if you moved here from um, the, the East Coast where these those are common, you come here, see a black rattlesnake, it's in the trees, hey, timber rattlesnake, but they're different. So that's more of a trivia thing. So uh, not a rattlesnake, but honorable mention because it is venomous, is a coral snake. Coral snakes are common around much of Arizona, but they are not dangerous. They are venomous, but they are not dangerous. Those are two different things, okay? Because a lot of times with some of these, danger involves your bad decision making and rattlesnakes accidents can happen but with coral snakes there's never once been a, a documented accidental bite like somebody walking around and it just bites them on the toe um, bites from coral snakes are rare and they are to the hands in the webbing of the hands or on the back of the hand or something like that this snake is small it's less than two feet long uh it does not it's not uh, even very defensive um, it, it's defense is actually to fart and run away. Uh, not kidding. It makes a sound out of the cloaca and tries to get away. So if you run after this thing and catch it and pick it up and it bites you, that is not an accident. That is um, bad decision making. I like to say coral snakes are dangerous in the same way that a bottle of Windex is in your house. A bottle of Windex is not a dangerous, aggressive thing. If you had a desire every time you saw a bottle of Windex to drink it, then a bottle of Windex is the most dangerous thing in your house. So coral snakes are kind of like that. Uh, if you are a homeowner here and you see an abundance of coral snakes around your property, what I'd be more concerned about is it means that you have a termite problem. Um, when we talk to homeowners that see a lot of coral snakes, it's often because they have an old shed, an old barn, an old wooden structure somewhere, a corral that is being eaten up by termites. There's a type of snake here called a thread snake that eats termite larvae. And coral snakes primarily will go after that type of snake. They're there hunting them. So if you have lots of termite larvae, you're going to have lots of small snakes that eat them. And in turn, coral snakes will show up. So call, a, call an exterminator if you see a coral snake or see a few, but not for the coral snakes, for the, the bugs. Um, yeah, very, very dangerous or not very, very venomous things, but not dangerous at all. Um, you all also might have heard of a rhyme on how to identify them about black and red, a guy named Jack and his social life. Uh, ignore all of that in certain parts of the country that can be useful. Uh, in Florida and Texas, where the yellow in this animal is very vivid uh, and it looks very different than the other types of snakes there, that rhyme could help. But here in Arizona, that white color that you see on that, it's kind of a cream. Sometimes it's just white. Sometimes it's yellow. Sometimes it's not. But we have seen people pick up coral snakes because they see it and are remembering the, the yellow and think, well, this is white. It's definitely not a coral snake. And then they pick it up. Uh, also, there are a number of, rattle, or of snakes here that um, kind of fit the rhyme too. And that logical process kicks in again, where you see something, assume that it's the most dangerous thing it could possibly be, and try to uh, prove it wrong from there based on the things you're seeing. And if, you're, if it's inconclusive, you're left with your original assumption. So what happens is people see that, or they see a long nose snake or a shovel nose snake, and can't quite use the rhyme to uh, say it's not a coral snake and it's not going to just kill everybody in town. So then they kill it. And then they send me pictures of the coral snake, which is a, a very harmless animal. Um, that log logical operation that we do when we're trying to identify things, uh, threats, assess threats, 
um, it comes up again and again. And if, you know, not related to snakes, but uh, anybody that's on social media, if anyone's on next door, you're probably familiar with this. Uh, anytime there's a, a, a animal track in the mud, an unknown animal track, it's never posted as just, what is this animal track? What made this? It is, I think I have a mountain lion in my backyard. I'm pretty sure there's a mountain lion on this trail because I don't know what this, this track is. So I'm going to just go ahead and assume the least likely answer because it's, to be honest with it, it's probably the most favoring to the story and just to our, our minds. We all kind of do this to some degree. Uh, coral snakes are, are, are similar to that, is that there's a lot of different things that if you're loosely applying uh, criteria that you see uh, to try to confirm that it's a coral snake, instead of starting with that you don't know what it is and kind of identifying it based on what you see, then a lot of times people have misidentifications of coral snakes. So, And another honorable mention, not a snake at all, is the Gila monster. Just like the coral snakes, there is no, there are no accidental bites from heel monsters. Um, they're not aggressive. They are not fast. If somebody says they saw a Gila monster run across the road and jump into the rocks, and uh, you know it, that was a chuckwalla. It wasn't a Gila monster. Um, they can be fast on a micro scale, meaning if you pick it, if you touch it or grab it, then it can quickly spin around and, and get you. So the key here is not to talk it, worry about how fast it is, but don't touch it, okay? Um, Gila monsters, when they do bite, it's to the hands or arms. So again, just like the coral snake, that is not an accident. That is bad decision-making. If you see a Gila monster and it um, is trying to scare you away, this is what it's gonna do. It's gonna show you the inside of its mouth, which is gonna have that black interior. That is supposed to terrify you. So just, all right, I'll leave you alone. Here's a little baby I saw in South Mountain that's just really giving it to me. So just leave it alone. Gila monster is not a danger. In fact, even if you see one in your yard, unless it's in danger, um, just leave it there. It'll go away. It's not after you or your dogs. It's after the quail eggs that you have in your yard somewhere. So if you don't want Gila monsters in your yards, don't worry about the Gila monsters. Get rid of the quail eggs. So rather than just blast you with a bunch of information about snakes and um, try to you know, it becomes a very boring presentation very quickly, even if you're relatively interested in snakes. It's just a bunch of facts. Um, it's easier and more relevant to talk about the way that this information is presented in our day-to-day -day conversation. When people see them on trails, when people talk to each other about their experiences over the weekend, when we see one at two o'clock in the morning when we're letting our dog out to go to the bathroom, all the things that we think about snakes and think about rattlesnakes and how important that is to us and our culture as Arizonans uh, comes to a head. So the myth, the mythology around rattlesnakes is a great way to talk about that. And why do we have so much mythology about rattlesnakes? Why are so many of these stories just wild? Um, I looked at some today, some of the posts that people put on, on Facebook and just the, the information, the misinformation that people that grew up here will, will just very confidently throw out there that is dangerously wrong it is incredible. It's, it's the majority of information that puts out there is dangerously wrong. What other topic is like that? I mean, I, I can think of a few right now, um, but this is one that, that I happen to know quite a bit about. So um, it's just a little more visible how, how different those things are. And, and the news is often uh, uh, guilty of that as well. So here we have lots of people and lots of rattlesnakes, fastest growing place in the country, more rattlesnakes than anywhere. So we have lots of interaction every day, every weekend. There are lots and lots of people, hundreds of people coming across rattlesnakes in their yards and on the trails. So we get lots of snake stories. And those stories, more so than experiences we have firsthand, are the things that are going to influence our thoughts about rattlesnakes. So why are those stories so dramatic? If, and I'm going to make this case, that rattlesnakes are not truly anywhere near as dangerous as we like to believe that they are. And I use that word intentionally, that we like to believe that they are. Why is it, why are these stories just, you know, put out as the near death experience or just something that ruined the weekend? Or I saw a rattlesnake out there, someone else saw a rattlesnake, so now I can't hike until, until the winter. Why is this something that um, is, is so common and kind of celebrated in, in our society? It's because we don't have the ability to tell the difference because we don't often get good information. Um, this is one source of that. And there's, there's a few different types of information that we're gonna go through here, but um, 
movies and television and media in general. And, and I'm going to include social media in here too. Obviously, these are ridiculous. Snakes on a plane and whatever this thing uh, the other guy's doing, uh, it comes from. I haven't seen it, but I mean, it's, these are not documentaries, obviously. We know that these are dumb. All of us. Everyone watching this knows that this is stupid, right? Um, but when you are hiking and you suddenly see a rattlesnake in front of you, your mind doesn't know that. You stop thinking about those things. This is a bed of context that when you see that snake, you're not being informed by what that snake is doing to you or what you think that snake is doing to you. You're seeing it through a lens of all this other stuff. And your mind can change that lens very quickly of how you perceive the world. A really good example of that, that we've probably all done, is if you've gone to go buy a new car or you've decided even that you've found a vehicle that says, oh, that car, I like that one. I'm going to get that one someday. Suddenly, that car is the most abundant car on the road. You see it everywhere. And it's not because everybody has suddenly had the same decision that you did about buying that car. It's that you have changed something in your mind, something you've noticed, and your view of the world has changed as a result. You're seeing the world differently because of something so subtle. So things like this that you can see and sit in the back of your head, even if it was 10, 20 years ago, um, can flavor the perception that you have of a snake. You can see a movie about a giant rattlesnake chasing somebody and know it's stupid and see a normal sized rattlesnake now that's not chasing you and see the wrong thing and remember something incorrect. It's kind of, a, 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 it's kind of annoying how, <laughs> how that works, but it, it is the case. Um, here's another source of that is the uh, misinformation that local news often puts out. Um, I'm, I'm on the news quite often. I was on the news this morning. I'm on local news quite a bit uh, talking about snake issues. And most of the time, something in that article is something that I think, that's not, that's not accurate. Somebody slipped that in there. Um, the way that we perceive news, the way that we share it around on social media is not to read the articles, it is to look at the headline and make an assumption based on whether that's true or not. And if the title is not worded in a way that uh, just kind of is a one word summary of the entire thing, then people could be misled. Mis misled. Uh, am I having that problem right now? I've made an article, I just called it, are these quail eggs? I'm hoping people would read the article to find out that they're not, they're not. Or are these rattlesnake eggs? They're gonna read it and think that they're not rattlesnake eggs because rattlesnakes don't lay eggs. But I, uh, I made a mistake because I just have tons and tons of people correcting me and saying I'm dumb because of course rattlesnakes don't lay eggs. They didn't read the article. And that's what happens in a lot of these places too. Um, the, the one here about the drought causing higher rates of snake bites in Southern California, that story's run every year, every year, drought or not. And there was a couple of years there where there was record rainfall. So that same story ran, it just changed to record rainfall causing more snake bites than ever before. Here locally in Arizona, we have that version, our version, which is that snakes are coming out earlier than they were the previous year, right? So every year there's a story that says snakes are coming out earlier than the previous year. So if you did the math on how many times that's been run consecutively, all these snakes that you're seeing out here right now are actually snakes from the future, from 2024, we're seeing really early. Snakes are still coming out as they're supposed to. And a lot of times at the bottom of articles like this, they'll have something that says, well, we, we contacted the state herpetologist or somebody from the university and he said that there's nothing, this is not true at all. But you decide if it's true or not. You know, so there's a lot of that kind of thing. Snakes get clicks, snakes excite us. Um, snakes are the reason that to fill up a presentation like this, which is an educational Zoom on a Monday night, has 191 participants in it and I didn't have to try hard. Even if you hate them, it catches attention and the news knows that and gets clicks. Uh, this other story, that a four-year-old girl survives a rattlesnake attack. They got the facts correct. It was a Southern Pacific rattlesnake that bit a little girl on the foot. It was an accident. She was rushed to the hospital. She got antivitamin. She survived. It was a painful experience. Um, you know, a lot of things that you can learn from that. But the story is not about that. The story is about a rattlesnake that stalked and attacked a little girl for some reason. So correct facts, but the characterization is wrong. So you're not going to get... It's very unlikely you're going to get accurate information or an accurate perception of what's going to happen from the news. So again, all this stuff, you see it all the time, especially as rattlesnake season warms up. All these are in the news every single day. You have very little chance of seeing your first rattlesnake of the year and seeing it 
for what it is with all this in your head. And the biggest reason, which is also the most challenging one for people like me, are just the people that we know. Our uncles, I like to call them. We all have that uncle. We all have that guy at the office that has those incredible stories every time they leave the house. There's some kind of crazy things that happen there and maybe true, maybe not, but people that we know, and this may be us too. Okay. If you're this guy, if you're this person, I'm saying guy, like not, Hey, you guys, I'm saying men. Um, if you are this person that, um, has these stories about rattlesnakes that, you know, you know that, that the version you tell isn't really, well, you, you know that, right? So, um, these kind these infect our culture. So that rattlesnakes start getting supernatural powers and abilities that they just don't have, or they act in ways that they just don't really do it. And it makes it tricky for me because if I'm going to say something like, there are no eight foot rattlesnakes in Arizona, they're not, and it didn't chase you, they don't, then I might be saying that that story that your, um, your husband or your uncle or you uh, have been telling for a long time, it didn't, didn't happen, right? Um, but that's okay. Because there are other problems with our brains that can make it so you can actually have that memory, even though it didn't happen. So there's the out here, if you wish to kind of get out of that, of that story. Um, so all these things together, all this misinformation that comes to us, all these social media posts, all this news, all the media, everybody that's scared of them, that's talking about it. There are two things, big things at play that stop you from having an accurate read. When you actually see that snake out there on a trail, all of these things get in the way. You're not being informed or scared of what the snake is doing to you because it's not doing anything to you. It's just sitting there. You're seeing this thing through all of this expectation of what you think is going to happen based on people that you trust and sources that you trust and all the emotional aspects of what you expect to happen. And that is what you're going to be left with. And then there's the other one, which is just our culture. Um, there is, there is a, a tremendous social benefit that is apparent in the way that we regard things that are perceived threats to us. Okay. Um, rattlesnakes are one of those things. If you are from the Southwest and there are rattlesnakes here, people will use their experiences with rattlesnakes to validate or identify with their tribe of Arizona or from the Southwest. Every time I'm talking about this, there are people that say, well, I'm from Texas. So, and then they talk about rattlesnakes with things that aren't true. Um, or, you know, go back to the city things like that. I don't, I don't live in the city. I live out in the, you know, out in the desert. Um, but there are a lot of things that people use to self-identify um, their culture and their like-mindedness with other people and things that um, we fear collectively are a great way for people to kind of group around those things. So lots of noise, signal to noise ratio is very high when it comes to rattlesnakes. So these are the top 11 myths that I hear. I'm going to leave the really silly ones that we know didn't happen. Uh, you know, giant rattlesnakes chasing after people. We'll leave that one alone. But these are the ones that I hear all the time, that I see every day, that I saw in Facebook comments five minutes before logging on here. Um, and these are ones you've probably heard of. And it doesn't matter if I'm giving this, this presentation to a room full of park rangers, somebody's going to see something that they thought was true and it probably told a lot of people that is, that is not true at all. So the first one's just an idea. This idea is aggression of rattlesnakes. This video, if you can see it on Zoom clearly because it gets kind of choppy, um, is what people think hiking in Arizona is like. You're just walking down the trail at Piestua and a rattlesnake sees you and it comes to kill you for some reason. That's not what happens. Um, this is what happens. This is a video I found on YouTube. Um, if you want to find the greatest collection of human stupidity ever amassed in one place, Go to YouTube and type rattlesnake into the search box and see what happens. It's not going to be a whole bunch of people acting logically and rationally and safely. It's going to be a bunch of this. This is a Western Diamondback rattlesnake. This is an Arizona from the looks of the vegetation. And here's an Arizona resident doing what Arizona residents do, which is to provoke this animal because there is a camera there. If this camera weren't there, this behavior probably wouldn't be happening. But in this instance, this has nothing to do with the snake. The snake is a vehicle that this individual can use to communicate something about themselves to other people. And snakes often find themselves in that category. But the point here is that this is not an aggressive animal. The correct, worst, the correct word to use is defensive. And that sounds like a very semantic argument that doesn't matter in any way. But the difference between an aggressive animal that picks the fight and a defensive animal that is just trying to prevent its own death is a big, big
Is that better? Okay. <laughs> Not sure what happened, but that's fine. Okay. So snakes are just trying to um, stop themselves from, stop themselves from dying, and they happen to have a weapon. They have venom, and that venom is something that they can use if they need to, to stop a predator. And they think that you're a predator. This guy is certainly acting like a predator to the snake. And if you were bitten by this rattlesnake, it's not going to go to the hospital as, well, I was messing around with this rattlesnake. I was doing some really, really stupid things. And, um, and I got bitten by it. I had, I, that was coming to me. I could see that going a mile away. No, it's going to be a rattlesnake attack. And it's going to go in the newspaper as a rattlesnake attack. And then this is going to be spread around as you can be attacked by a rattlesnake in your yard. Right? You can be bitten by a rattlesnake in your yard, but we have to really look at it for what it is. And you can be surprised. We'll talk about that more too. This is another big one. You can tell the how old a snake is by the number of rattle segments that it has on its tail. It's false. Uh, rattlesnakes shed their skins several times a year. And each time that they do, they can get a new rattle segment on there. So that means you can't tell how old it is. Also, also, they break off pretty easily too. It's made of the same stuff as your fingernails. So when it gets wet and dries in the sun and the heat and dragging over rocks and bushes, it breaks off. So you can see a snake that is 30 years old that has one rattle segment and you can't look at that. And people will do that and go, that is a big baby rattlesnake. Wow. It's not, it's just a rattlesnake that's, that's seen some things. Uh, here's a picture of a rattlesnake whose rattle has broken off. This is a big adult. It's not growing. It's rattle segments are all the same size. Um, and yeah, can't tell what it is. Total myth. And if you believe this, it's not your fault. Somebody told you. It could have been the Discovery Channel or Animal Planet or a Cub Scout leader or something like that. Um, but it's just one of the many myths. So this is a really common one. Um, has everyone seen this? I think that this is, this is probably one of the most common ones is that um, baby rattlesnakes are worse than adults. That baby rattlesnakes are more dangerous than adults. And I'm being very careful how I phrase that because these are all different, um, different things. I'm gonna try something really fast. Can you still hear me? Okay. I think I accidentally just hit the mute button with my finger when I was excitedly talking about something. <laughs> anyway. Um, so baby rattlesnakes are not more dangerous than adults. And there's lots of different reasons why people would think that, um, mostly because we just hear it from all the time. I actually did some work for the Discovery Channel one time, and I said very specifically, because we were dealing with baby rattlesnakes in that video, that um, do not put that in there. Please do not put my face and name on something that says that baby rattlesnakes are more dangerous than adults. It's a guarantee that wouldn't happen. And when I saw the video, when it aired, of course, someone snuck it in there. It's just one of these beloved myths um, that people people like. We like our mythology. We like our local lore. There's something identifying about our culture in it. And this is one of those. Um, so one of the reasons why people believe that baby rattlesnakes are more dangerous than adults is the fact that their venom can be more toxic than the adults. The reason for that, and there's lots of reasons, um, but one of those is just that they eat different things. Or maybe they need to kill it faster because they don't have as much venom as an adult rattlesnake uh, or they eat things that can take flight right like a lizard or a bird um, lots of different reasons their diet is different is one of the biggest ones so um the difference in that toxicity doesn't matter though when you're looking at venom yield and when i mean venom yield that's how much potential venom a rattlesnake can give you so a big rattlesnake can give you multiple multiple times more venom than the, than what a baby rattlesnake possibly could so the differences in those talk in the toxicity doesn't matter at all. The metaphor I use for that is this shot of whiskey or a gallon of wine. The shot of whiskey is fine. You can have that, you know, maybe have another one. You'll, you'll be okay. Uh, if you drink a gallon of wine, much less potent than the whiskey, you're not going to feel great. Right? So it's just, it's not true. It's been checked. It's not true. But the more common one is this one. And I do have these papers in here. I'm not expecting anyone to pause and read these things. Um, these are here just so that you know, I'm just, I'm basing these on, on, on peer reviewed research. This, these are facts. These are not opinions that I have. So if you differ with me on this and you want to disagree, you know, save it, uh, feel free to, to publish a, a response to this paper, to these, these PhDs, rather than to leave it in my comments. Cause that's who you need to talk to about uh, these things. If you disagree, um, but rattlesnakes that are babies have just as much control over the uh, venom that they give uh, a defensive bite uh, as the adults. 
the, the idea that baby rattlesnakes are not experienced enough and always just give you all the venom that they have where adults are going to hold it back and you have a higher chance of a dry bite. Um, there's no evidence for it. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, even if it were true, it wouldn't matter because the potential venom yield that a baby has, even if it's giving you everything it has is a fraction of what an adult rattlesnake can give you. So there's lots of ways that people will continue to justify this idea that baby rattlesnakes are more dangerous than adults. I saw one today where somebody said that baby rattlesnakes are more likely to just attack out of nowhere, where adult rattlesnakes are, are less likely to do that. That's, that's also a mischaracterization. Um, baby rattlesnakes and adult rattlesnakes can both be dangerous. A bite from a baby rattlesnake can certainly be a dangerous thing, but bites from adult rattlesnakes are typically worse just because they're bigger. They have more capable... Um, strike ranges, they're, they're just a more dangerous animal in general. If you step on a four foot diamondback, um, a lot of things can happen. You can be bitten on the knee, you can be bitten on the ankle. If you step on an eight inch diamondback, you have a squished diamondback on your foot, you know? So there's a to totally different thing. Um, so if you are a homeowner, um, these products do not work. I wish they did. Uh, that's how I pay my mortgage and, and pay for my bills is to keep rattlesnakes out of people's yards. And if it was as easy as me showing up every once in a while and sprinkling some of this stuff that sound, smells like a cat box in somebody's yard and I collect a check and go home, that'd be awesome. That's not reality though. Uh, these snake repellents do not stop snakes. We see no difference at all in yards that are treated with, with snake away and snake repellent products and yards that are not other than one of them smells like a cat box and the other one doesn't. Uh, if you spend money on this stuff, stop. Um, if your pest control guy is recommending it to you, it doesn't mean that they're lying to you or they're a bad person. They got tricked by the marketing too. The marketing for these products says that it works. You're asking to keep snakes out of the yard and your pest control guy says, well, I got a thing to do here. We can do this. It's not their fault, but you should also stop using that, that, um, that particular thing. It doesn't work. Um, how do we know this? We find snakes sleeping in it. <laughs> I find sleeps, find snakes crossing it or sleeping on it. Here's the diamondback with a bunch of mothballs around it that were laid there for uh, to repel them. Mothballs and snake away are the same thing. This one's in a powder and the other one. And here's a snake crossing rope. Um, here is an unposed photograph that one of our relocation team took several years ago uh, where somebody had put a lot of snake away around the yard. So much, in fact, that there was kind of a two-day job and there were more bags that needed to be laid down created a shaded area when the bags were stored against the side of the house and uh, rattlesnake moved into that shaded area. So he pulled the snake, the bag away. And here's what you see, a rattlesnake not caring in any way about snake away. Um, this is also the reason that I am banned from the face, the snake away Facebook page. So if you're using it, stop. If your neighbor's using it, stop using it. So this is uh, a fun one for me right? Rattlesnake eggs. You can buy these at any gift store, like nature center stuff, or like they get, I like to pick on that gas station on the way to Tucson. Cause they just have all of the ridiculous rattlesnake things in there that we'd love to, you know, love to think are, are, are real, you know, but they're not, these are, it's like a little manila envelope. And it's got a, uh, stop listening if you haven't had this happen to you. So don't ruin it for you. Um, but it's like a little wind up thing and a, and a rubber band. And if someone looks in there, it makes a rattling sound. You can scare your dad with it. That's a good, good time. I'll still buy them if I can. But what I think is, is interesting here is we get back into that logical process I had talked about earlier, where um, the, the belief of the unlikely but most um, spectacular is a thing that we're often left with if we don't have other evidence. So let's try to avoid that type of thinking because, um, well, first, rattlesnakes don't lay eggs. So if someone calls me and says, I have rattlesnake eggs in my yard, I don't need to see them. I know they're not. They're not rattlesnake eggs because rattlesnakes don't lay eggs any more than uh, people lay eggs. This is a mother, Arizona Originals rattlesnake with her newborn babies that I photographed several years ago. That's how they do it. Um, but we get lots of emails and calls and Facebook messages. Um, and I'm sure you've seen this too, especially on Nextdoor. I don't know what it is about Nextdoor, but somehow they've taken the They've taken the uh, the reins from Facebook on like weird misinformation being passed around between between neighbors. Um, when people see quail eggs, there's something that happens very often where they see these unidentified eggs in the yard. And what are they? What could they be? Could it be the quail that are here? Is it the doves that are here that I see every day? Is it any of the numerous 
lizards that I see and different types of birds, I bet it's rattlesnakes. I bet it has to be rattlesnakes. In fact, I know it's rattlesnakes. It has to be. And, and to the point where I'm going to call a service and, and pay to have them come and remove these eggs, which if I don't, then, you know, all these little baby rattlesnakes are going to hatch out and destroy everything. Um, that's just the way our brains work. These are, these are not dumb people. These are people and our brains, you know, people are, <laughs> that's the way we, we are. And there's something about that. We fear something that that least likely but spectacular result is often the thing we're left with. Um, so obviously they're not rattlesnake eggs. Um, occasionally I'll still go get them. I won't, I'm not going to charge for it, obviously, but uh, just because sometimes I, I get the impression on the phone that they're still going to squish the eggs up um, just in case. Because uh, they'll say that sometimes. Like, you sure that I, I know they don't lay eggs, but maybe this one time, they, maybe this one time they did. So it's interesting. I'll go get them. My heel monsters love them. So if they're going to get squished up anyway, might as well. So this is a one for hikers. Still a common one. Saw it a few times today um, in comments here and there. Um, that when you are hiking, you should wear heavy boots so that you can stomp heavily on the ground and hit the ground and hit rocks around you with, with the sticks and hiking poles as you're going. Because what that's going to do is all the rattlesnakes on the trail ahead of you are going to sense you coming through the ground, the vibrations, and flee for their lives because or give them a chance to escape. Um, it does not work. Um, this can be dangerous misinformation too. And why it's dangerous misinformation is because if you are doing this and you believe that rattlesnakes are not going to be on the trail because you're doing something that's not doing anything, then you may let your guard down. It's dangerous in the same way that snake repellent not only doesn't work, but is dangerous because people put snake repellent down and then think their yard can't have rattlesnakes in it and they have their toddlers playing in the backyard without their shoes on. So things that don't work are not only ineffective, but dangerous. And this is one of those things. So why, how do I know it doesn't work? Uh, I've, I've tried it. <laughs> I've, I have found, you can actually find this on our, our YouTube channel if you want to see one instance of it. But I just want to see how far away they can, you know, it's been tested to how far away they can sense vibrations, what their reactions are to different types of stressors, uh, visual stress or heat pit uh, senses, that kind of thing. Their, their defense, if they sense very slight vibrations. So, you know, your ability to shake the earth at distance by walking heavier is probably higher it's probably lower than what you expect it to be and even if they can detect it it doesn't mean they're going to react to it uh, and it certainly doesn't get them to to leave I, I found rattlesnakes that are sitting there in ambush and i just get barely out of sight and i jump up and down and throw boulders on the ground and they don't care uh, even if it got them to move out of the way one out of ten times which it doesn't um it means that it, it's not working enough for you to really rely on it as in any kind of uh, repelling thing um, what's, what actually happens too, is that when a rattlesnake is rattling or even if it flees, that is not their first defense. Rattling is not what they do first and running away is also not what they do first. This is what they do first. This is a rattlesnake that's sitting there in ambush. Um, their camouflage is their first line of defense. This is why the majority of rattlesnake encounters that you're going to have, that most of us have, um, are ones you'll never know because you've just walked right past the snake. And that is what the snake wants. It's not going to rattle when you get close. It's going to rattle when it thinks that its primary defense, which is to remain still and not be seen, doesn't work anymore. So if you are hiking and you are sufficiently stressing out the snakes ahead of you on a trail, you would be essentially gluing them in place because they would go to their first line of defense, which is to hide from the predator. And potentially potentially by the time you got there, make it even more likely for you to be bitten because that snake has already gone through some stress and you're not a new thing. You're a continuation of a threat. So um, there's no evidence that this does anything to keep snakes away. And if it did, it would most likely cause a more dangerous situation than if you did nothing at all. So if do not rely on heavy sticks stomping on the ground to keep snakes away from you. Baby rattlesnakes, having no rattles. I hear that every day. Um, this is a night snake, by the way. This picture here is not a rattlesnake that's called a night snake. It's a very common snake that people get in their houses, um, in their kitchens, um, bathrooms, laundry rooms. <clears throat> the reason why that shows up in those places so often is because they're very small snakes. This one's maybe a foot long. They eat a lot of invertebrates, they eat lizards, um, and they get in through pipes. So if you have septic, or if you're a new build, if you have a home that's a new build, 
Um, you might be surprised in the way your cabinets are put together. If you look under the kitchen sink, the pipe's nice and sealed back there. But if you pulled the whole cabinet away, sometimes there's just a big hole that goes under the house where the pipes come in. And that's where that's where a lot of the scorpions you see come from, too. Um, but you can see on this snake, and this is why I'm showing it, is that it has a pointed tail, a clearly pointed tail. And that is different from a rattlesnake. Uh, even very young ones. This is a newborn Western Diamondback rattlesnake that is hours old. And you can very clearly see the first section of rattle, which is called a pre-button. <clears throat> that is the section of rattle that they are born with. They all have it. In the event that a rattlesnake's rattle is damaged to where it's no longer there or it's cut off or there's some kind of deformity while it's being formed and it's born without a rattle, the default for no rattle on a rattlesnake is not pointed tail. A pointed tail is actually a pretty complex structure. It's not just what happens when there's no tail. So if, even if there was no rattle here, it would at least be rounded off. So a, a, a tail that gradually comes to a pointed end is not a rattlesnake. And it does something interesting to our brains too, that logical process problem that we, when we fear with the, the least likely but spectacular answer shows up again, um, where somebody sees a snake and they'll, they'll, they'll remark on a four foot long rat, uh, gopher snake obviously not a rattlesnake, but they'll look at it and say, look at its pointed tail and go, that is the biggest baby rattlesnake I've ever seen. Look at that thing. It's huge. It's a huge baby rattlesnake. The idea that it's not a rattlesnake just never really enters our brains. Again, these are not dumb people. It's just what happens when you see something you're scared of. Um, you don't, you don't get the luxury a lot of times of thinking logically. There's a lot of things that can go wrong there in that line of thought, but yeah, baby rattlesnakes, they have rattles. Doesn't mean they work. Doesn't mean they make a sound yet, but they do have rattles. So if you're a hiker or a camper and you have one of these devices, these snake bite kits in your pack, as soon as this is over, go get it and throw it away. It does not work. It does not keep get venom out of your, your wound. It's not going to help you. Um, in fact, it can make the bite worse. Um, venom that's going through your body and causing uh, it's necrotizing flesh and just causing the least thing you want to do. The last thing you want to do is put a big bruise on top of that. So uh, even if that weren't the case, it would just, um, it's just wasting time. And it is incredible that these are sold at all, considering it is a medical device that is sold casually. And this is not medical device or medical thing like putting something on a mosquito bite that would make it a little better. This is a device that is commonly sold at REI and I think Walmart still sells them, hopefully I'm inaccurate in both of those, um, that is made to give you time in the event of a potentially fatal accident. It is incredible that that is allowed to be sold, especially when it's been proven to not work and make, make it worse. So um, yeah, if, you, if you know someone, any of those organizations that, you know, Maybe, maybe tell them to, to knock it off. I know it makes money. I know you can sell things that make money, but this is literal snake oil. Um, the idea here is that it's going to bring the venom out so you don't have to, uh, to go to the hospital or it'll buy you some time. In fact, the term, anything that has the term draw the venom out, which I've seen people say honey, essential oils. Uh, somebody said prickly pear the other day. Um, <clears throat> there's no such thing as draw the venom out. In the same way that if you took a big syringe full of bleach and plunged it into your arm and put it all up there, what are you going to rub on that little tiny pinprick that you just put in your leg that's going to make all the bleach come out? Nothing. It's an internal injury. So there's nothing, no device you can use in the outside of your body that's going to make it better. Um, but just in case you do have one of those things laying around, I found one of these, um, you know, someone I know has that. Uh, this instructional video is, is what I put together of how to use it. Throw it in, in there. Please do it after this video is over. It's not good. So this myth is a fun one because um, it's one that I is a new myth that I'm watching grow and spread around the country and here uh, reflected back to me from people that just heard it from somebody else. And it is the idea that rattlesnakes are evolving not to rattle anymore because of a variety of reasons. In Texas, the myth goes that it's because hogs are interacting with them and causing them to rattle less. Uh, in Arizona and some other places, it's because rattlesnakes that rattle a lot, alert people to their presence and are therefore killed. Um, whatever the reason is, um, the idea is, and I'm happy at least there's some basic knowledge of natural selection in this myth, is that snakes that are noisy and give themselves away get killed more often and don't 
uh, pass on their, their loud genes to the baby. So we're evolving uh, quiet rattlesnakes. The problem with this is that this myth is sprouting up in multiple, like tons of little populations across different species for different reasons across the country simultaneously within the last 10 years. So that's, that's not happening. Um, also, there's no evidence for it. So there kind of is now, and this is where it gets a little bit confusing and a little bit annoying and misleading is that um, here's an article here um, that was on NPR and there's lots of local papers that do this too. There are lots of anecdotes where somebody sees rattlesnakes that they believe can't rattle anymore or, or won't rattle anymore. And um, at the bottom of this article, just like those other ones I mentioned, there's a part of it that says, well, we, we contacted the, the local uh, university to ask the herpetologist there if that's happening. And of course, there's no evidence, but we're still going to run the story. The problem with that kind of journalism is that the story still remains there. So if someone wants to look it up to see if it's true after someone corrects them and helps them understand that this is not happening, they're going to be greeted with a big list of articles from reputable sources that say that it is happening, or at least has that discussion. And we know that people don't read the articles, especially not to the end. So if you're just reading the headlines, you're left with a false perception uh, that this is happening. Um, some people, if you're an experienced hiker or an experienced outdoors person, um, you can have the experience that um, rattlesnakes rattle less over time. And that's because you got better at seeing them. When you were younger, maybe every rattlesnake you saw rattled. And maybe when you're 50, maybe one in five of them rattle. This is because you're seeing the rattlesnakes that are always there and now you're just better at spotting them. So there's lots of things here, but in reality, rattlesnakes rattle. They do it as part of the defense if they're scared of something. And that can be variable. The rattlesnakes at the research area that we uh, have in the Phoenix Mountain Preserve, a lot of those rattlesnakes don't rattle at people that are riding their mountain bikes past them. The reason is because there's 500 mountain bikes that pass them every single day and they just don't care anymore. So rattlesnakes actually learn really well and can recognize a threat uh, from one that's not. And if there's lots of hikers around, they just might not, might not rattle. It's not going to help them out. So they don't, but give them a little time, move them somewhere else, give them a little time to calm down uh, and they will certainly start rattling again. This is an interesting myth that has a lot to do with people again, uh, more so than snakes. These are all giant rattlesnakes that are showing up in the news. Um, I think that one of these, the one that's being held from the pole all the way up that was reported as 15 feet long and 197 pounds. The other ones reported at nine and 15 feet and 12 feet. Why am I throwing out more than, than uh, three numbers for three different snakes? Because these snakes have been posted dozens and dozens of times by local papers throughout the country in regions where this species of rattlesnake an Eastern diamondback rattlesnake doesn't even exist. The same pictures, that's the level of, of journalism that we, <laughs> that we have for, um, for snake related things. Um, also when people send me pictures of, of these animals, a lot of times they'll include themselves in it too. This is my friend and I, we were hunting in Montana. This is my cousin from, from uh, New York state. This is my uh, best friend's brother's dad from California. You know, there's, there's some way that people attach themselves to it on the way out the door. So once again, these rattlesnakes become very important ways for people to communicate. And then there's this too. Once again, you are looking at these snakes and if you're wondering why they're so big, I know these snakes, if they're five feet, five, five and a half feet long, any of them, I'd be surprised. Um, they're much smaller than that. So why do they look so big? For the same reason that my phone, if, I, if you were to show this to somebody, right? And they said, they, well, they wouldn't say, why is that guy's phone so big? Why is it so huge? Why does he have the biggest phone you could possibly have? Because it's a phone and it doesn't hijack your senses. And you realize the obvious that something that is closer to the camera looks bigger. That's all that's happening here. The thing that's held closer to the camera looks bigger than if it's not. That's it. Yeah. Classic fisherman. Like there's a reason why people hold fish like this. It's not because it's the most comfortable way to hold a fish. That's because it makes the story better. And rattlesnakes are a good way to get those stories. So, um, and it's not your fault if you didn't recognize that right away because our brains can be tricked. Even if you know it, it's called forced perspective. If you watch the Lord of the Rings movies, then you were tricked by forced perspective. The way that they constructed the sets made it look like the little guys were much smaller than the big guys. They were just 
further away. That's all that was. And I just put them on the same focal plane and, and shot it. It wasn't computers. So uh, this, this is a, a very well-known optical trick. And when you are shown something that you fear, your ability to logically decipher what's happening goes away pretty quickly. And we're just very bad at telling the size of snakes. In Arizona, a four foot Western diamondback is a very large snake. A five foot, an actual five foot long Western diamondback is, is very rare. It's very rare. I see you know, hundreds of Western diamondbacks a year. Um, we remove more hundreds at yards and we, we, we see tons of them. There's, and I'm not the only person that there's everyone that actually has a, has a tape measure in their hand when they're looking at snakes. And there's something about having a tape measure that makes snakes shrink. Um, we don't see five foot snakes. We certainly don't see six foot snakes. I've never seen a six foot diamondback. There's never been one documented here. So it's not just me giving an anecdote just because I've seen a lot of snakes of people that document snakes and look for them with that purpose or people that don't do that and are killing them or measuring them and submitting those data. There has never been a six foot rattlesnake here. There's certainly never been a seven foot rattlesnake here. You can get large sizes in other states. Eastern diamondbacks can get, can get pretty big. There are some that are over, over seven feet long, but um, you know, it get incredibly rare. What is much more common is that we're just not very good at telling the size of things. Um, we overestimate our abilities to be able to tell how long something is. Um, if you had a piece of rope and you put it on the ground and ask somebody to recall it a week later how, how long that was, do you think they're gonna be able to tell you to the inch exactly how long it was? especially if it was coiled or if they're scared of it, of course not. Um, when we are scared of things, this is our brain being bad again. When we are scared of things, it can change our perception. It can change our memories and warp those things. Um, your perception of time, your perception of how big something is, how close it is, uh, how quickly it's closing distance on you, those things can all be warped in, in your mind. And when you're forming a memory, this is really important to understand because you might have a memory. I might be telling you right now, somebody's watching this thinking that guy's full of it because I remember very clearly I saw a snake that was 70 feet long and it, and it chased after me. I can see that this guy's full of it. Your memory is not a direct digital version copy of what happened. Your memory and what happens can be different things. There is a big reason why eyewitness accounts are not considered great evidence in court. Um, there's a reason why there are a lot of rules for how somebody can be interrogated. Just this last weekend, we saw a mountain lion on a bio blitz and we saw it run across the road. We all saw it very clearly. We cannot tell if there was a collar on it or not. And the reason for that, one of the person, one of the, the persons with us said they thought they saw, the, saw a collar. So now my memory, I see a collar on that cat, but I don't, I don't know. I don't think it was there. We're, we're very susceptible to this. And it's hard for us to recognize because we have to first recognize that our brains are faulty in, in a lot of ways in this way in particular. When you have a memory, when you're, when you're remembering something visual, remember something, try to remember the last time you went hiking or maybe a time you went hiking last year. The fact that you are remembering this and seeing in your head right now means that you are also altering that memory in real time. When you remember something, you're not remembering the original event. You're literally remembering the last time that you remembered it. So in that way, you're playing telephone game with yourself and the greater fear and other factors are in there, misinformation, news stories, other people's stories, um, all that stuff that comes together can really warp that perception over time. So if you say you have a memory of a snake that was seven feet long, I absolutely believe you have that memory. You, you, you do. But it also doesn't mean there was a seven foot long rattlesnake. So it's complicated. And this is the last one I'm going to talk about, the last myth. But it's, it's a good one because this is something that I think is most relevant for, for people that like to hike. Um, I, I, I feel disheartened when I see um, people online say, after seeing that there are rattlesnakes out again, you know, it's not a surprise. We live here. Um, that they're done hiking for the year, that they're done camping for the year, that they're going to resume hiking again in November and they're going to miss out on all this stuff. Um, seeing a rattlesnake is not a near death experience. And that is often the perception. Um, I saw somebody today post that they had to turn around. They're walking their dogs and they saw a snake cross the trail. The snake wasn't doing, it was just crawling across the trail. They turned around and went home. Um, that happens a lot. 
and it is not an accurate view of what's actually out there. If you're out there and you see a snake that is on a trail, um, you've certainly walked past several. I mean, in fact, if you're going to go hiking out here, it's April. If you go hiking, if you go hike a mile on any of the preserves here, you're going to walk past some snakes, some rattlesnakes, and they're not going to necessarily let you know that they're there. That's not what they want to do. They want you to keep on walking and you're doing that. Um, that doesn't mean that you should stop hiking because that's terrifying. What that should mean is that um, seeing a snake does not mean that the situation is any more or less dangerous than it ever was. Seeing it is just a little slice of the, the bigger picture. And it's, it's more a matter of coincidence. There's nothing there that's causing new danger. In fact, if you see a snake and it's over there, there is no danger whatsoever from the animal, unless you choose to go over there. That snake is not going to do anything to you. A lot of that's in the phrasing. When people are scared of snakes and talking about it, they see a snake and say things like, it terrified me. It caused me to turn around. These snakes are making me not want to go hike. And once people can really realize what they're saying is that these snakes are not making, are not doing any of those things. Those are things that we are doing because we're seeing the snake. Um, if you're that, if, if that's, a, if I'm describing you, um, realize that you have a lot of power over the way that you're going to perceive that thing. And uh, you have a lot of choices here. You know, we're looking at the same snakes. I'm not scared of them in any way, but you know, you may be. But we're looking at the same animals, the same snakes are there and we're all here, all still here, you know, and it's not that fear itself is not that, you know, that's, that is always going to be a problem for a lot of people. I'm scared of roller coasters. I'll admit it. I, you'll never get me on a roller coaster. I just don't want to, <laughs> don't want to do it. I know I'm probably missing out on some fun, uh, but, it, and it's also, a, it's irrational. It's an irrational fear. So we all have those. And for you, it may be rattlesnakes. Rattlesnakes learn very well from us. So when they have stressful events, a lot of their home range and the places that they're going to use and find useful are fed by uh, experiences that they're going to have, whether it be a stressful experience, a good one, like they succeed in hunting uh, or fail in hunting, things like that. So in areas where uh, they routinely run into people or threats, they may avoid those areas. So there's really no reason at all for somebody to go and try to kill a snake if they see one on a trail. Um, if you're hiking and you see a, a snake that's there, um, killing it is not going to save somebody in the future because you've killed the, the monster of the mountain. There are a lot of snakes there. And the facts are that it's, it's really not um, that dangerous. It's pretty notable when somebody's bitten. And seeing a snake is not notable either. It doesn't make new danger. In the same way that if you suddenly saw your mailman, you don't suddenly get more mail the next day. It just happens, right? So it's a chance encounter that doesn't change it, but your perception might. Okay, so what is the perception that people have when it's spring and all these rattlesnakes out there for how much people worry about it, how easy it was to fill this, this Zoom with, with people and all the discussion every time someone posts a rattlesnake, all the, the little gifts that people are posting with people running away and people just freaking out about snakes. You would expect this is caused because there's just a line of ambulances going from Camelback Mountain to, to, uh, to Mayo, right? There's just non, it's just a bloodbath. And all these trails, you know, people just scream. It, it, it's it's obviously not not happening. Um, bites are are pretty unlikely. I mean, it does happen occasionally. There was one that was just in the news um, that somebody, a woman, was bitten on on the ankle by a snake. It was a total accident. So it does happen, um, but it's not worth not hiking. So the math on that is that last year um, there were fewer than 200 bites in the state of Arizona. And that is with how many people we have here and all the rattlesnakes that we have and all, uh, including the people that were bitten because they were picking them up or have killed them or did something they weren't supposed to do of accidental bites where someone's just walking around and hiking and is just bitten out of nowhere. Um, it's, 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 it's very rare for how many people we have here and zero people died. And this, this year's stats are going to look about the same. And the next year, I mean, these are, these are, it's a, it might grow in comparison to the number of people that are here, but it's not going to be a big problem. Um, so yes, it can be a potential danger, but absolutely not. It is not something that you should um, consider to be such a danger to the point where if you enjoy being outdoors uh, that it should prevent you. That is not to say that fear isn't real and you're not, you know, I'm not trying to downplay the fear that you have, but if you're the type of person that can use information like this to try to reconcile those two things, the facts of the matter, that it's not that dangerous to be out there when rattlesnakes are around and how you feel about it. If you can bring those things together using information, then this might be something that can help you do that.
If you are terrified of snakes, just to help illustrate a little bit, um, here are some of the other things that should really keep you up at night. And this is in the United States compared to the zero to two deaths that happen each year from venomous snakes, including other venomous snakes like uh, cobras that people have as pets. So zero to two deaths each year in the United States. 450 people a year fall out of bed and, and die from it in the United States. When you have 350 million people in an area, you start getting these little weird statistical uh, things like this, these little quirks that don't seem like they're true, but they are. And all those people here, zero to two deaths from rattlesnakes falling out of bed, much worse. Coconuts, watch out. They are uh, 100 times, 100 plus times more likely to kill you than a rattlesnake. High school football also. Uh, champagne corks, that was a surprising one. So compared to the zero people or one person here that might die from a venomous snake bite, uh, 24 people were pointing the bottle the wrong way when they popped it and died and vending machines, vending machines on average kill 13 people a year because that sticker that says, don't tip this over, um, wasn't, wasn't listened to and it tips over. But, you know, you could be watching this in a building that has a vending machine in it right now, you know, and it's loose. Um, you know, if people saw vending machines and the reaction to snacks was to start shooting at it, the number would be much higher. In fact, you start getting these little weird anomalies too, where um, you have, there are years where the number of people that are killed by errant gunfire while they're shooting at a snake is higher than the number of people that are killed by snakes. So it is very much something that can be a danger, but a lot of it is just in our heads. And the cure for our, our perceived fear and perceived danger can also be uh, much worse than the actual problem. So the most effective way to stay safe out there, to stay safe is just to avoid them. Um, they're trying to avoid you too. You guys have this in common. You and the snakes see eye to eye on this. You are, uh, um, you don't want to meet each other for the most part. Uh, snakes are very good at not uh, being seen by us. And if they do uh, feel threatened by us, they let us know. Isn't that, it's pretty polite actually. Um, and you want to do the same thing. So avoiding rattlesnake encounters out there on the trail. This picture is a speckled rattlesnake that was called into us. It was on a trail um, near Paestua Peak. And um, when it was called in uh, to our, our research project, I thought that it was going to be on some little side trail that no one ever visits. So I went up there and uh, found the snake. It was there. And while I was pulling out my equipment so that I could pit tag it and measure it and do all those things, Numerous hikers came right by it and went past it. The snake had been doing this for days. Probably dozens and dozens of hikers um, and joggers stepped right over the thing. And no one got hurt by it because the snake doesn't see him as a threat. Um, if you saw this snake, you could avoid it very easily. So just try to be careful when you're hiking or doing anything, especially if you're gardening or moving things around or working. Don't reach or step into places that you can't see clearly. Try to store things in a way that you can maximize visibility. If you're gardening, go for plants that you can see around. Just try to make it so you can use your eyes more than anything else. Your eyes are your best tool against rattlesnakes. Um, have a bright flashlight available. If you, I live out in the middle of the desert. Uh, if I'm going to go out to my car at night, I always have a flashlight. In fact, we have a little shelf by all of the doors in the house so that with flashlights on them, they're always charged so that there's never an excuse to just go outside without a flashlight and be bitten by something. That is how it happens on accident. Be alert um, and pay attention to the ground. Um, people have been bitten because they're walking down a trail and looking at their phone. Um, avoid using headphones if you can too because they have a rattle that doesn't work. <laughs> the warning doesn't work. Um, and I do get comments whenever I say that too, that sometimes they're kind of snarky. Well, I, if, I'm, if I'm hearing impaired, I should never go hiking. No, it just means be a little more cautious in the, in the same way you may be cautious you know, if in an area with traffic. Use your eyes, watch for the snakes that are there um, and, and do your best to, to avoid them there. Um, and be really cautious near certain types of microhabitats that snakes might find useful. That would might in include debris areas, heavy brush, uh, drainages, like when you're going, when you're hiking and it's crossing a wash, those areas can have uh, a lot of, a lot of snakes in them and rocky piles. Just kind of be aware that they could be anywhere, but just be cautious. Uh, and especially if you're hiking early morning or at sundown. So snakes are not nocturnal or diurnal. They are crepuscular, which means that they're out at the right times, which is often at the dawn and dusk time. So if you're somebody, as soon as it starts getting into triple digits, 
most of these snakes are going to be mostly active at night, but you can encounter them right at dusk and in the, the sun up hikes. That's when people see them the most. Right now, when you're hiking, expect to see them between roughly 3 p.m. and dark is when they're moving the most. If you encounter a rattlesnake and it's over there, it's not right at your feet. And when I say right at your feet, um, within two feet or so, one step, we'll say one step. Um, cool, you saw a rattlesnake. You got a good story for the weekend. Take a picture of it. It's not going to hurt you. It's not going to come towards you. I, I do this all the time. It's, a, it's how I got into this. I love looking for them and finding them and taking pictures of it. Take it, take it. I mean, don't go near it. Don't provoke it. Um, don't throw pebbles at it. Don't poke it with a stick. Don't do anything stupid. Take a picture of it and leave it alone. This snake in this picture was a speckled rattlesnake that just hung out there. I took some photos of it and left it right there. That's it. So cool. You saw a rattlesnake. That's it. Um, and don't worry about it. It's not a danger. It's not a danger unless you go over there and do something with it. If you do have other people with you that are around you that maybe aren't as smart as you are, prevent them from doing dumb things. It might be kind of awkward if it's your friend and you're trying to, you know, talk them out of doing something, but you know, you're helping them out. And that post hike beer back at the parking lot isn't going to happen if your friend is being life lighted to the hospital because he did something stupid. So stop him from doing it and just enjoy your hike. Seeing a rattlesnake is not a dangerous thing. Seeing a rattlesnake is what's supposed to happen. And if you have that experience where there's a rattlesnake rattling and you didn't step on it, that's how that's supposed to work. It could feel scary, but that is actually a very safe thing. That is what the snake wants. And that's what you want too. If you encounter a rattlesnake that's right under your feet, that's right next to you, quickly move the opposite way, not slowly back up. I often hear people say that. Stop and look where the snake is and then slowly re... Nope. The snake is not asking nicely. If there's a snake that's rattling at you suddenly, back up right now is what that snake is saying. It's not saying take your time. Uh, it's a pit viper. It can see you very well. It knows you're there. You're not fooling it by moving uh, slowly. If you don't know which direction the rattle came from, go the way you came and just, you know, maybe five steps, 10 steps, and you're good. Don't grow running down the entire mountain or else you could hurt yourself that way too. Snake's not going to chase after you. Yeah. Don't freeze. Don't wake back, back up slowly. Get out of there. If there's other people around there, you can tell them. Um, but if there's a snake and it's rattling on a, on a trail and it looks like it won't leave, it's not defending its territory. I, people, I see people use the word territorial a lot when they see a rattlesnake on a trail and it won't leave. The snake is not leaving because you're not leaving. The snake is there because you're there. And it's saying, hey, you need to get out of here. I need to get out. Don't kill me. I want to go. And you're still there looking at it. Um, or maybe even poking it out with a stick or throwing pebbles at it, You're, that attack is still happening from the snake's perspective. You get out of sight, count to, count to 60 and come back, that snake is gone. It's going to want to leave and it's not going to just go hang out right next to the trail. It wants to get away from you too. It's going to take that chance. So give a snake a chance to escape. It will escape. Get out of sight. If you see one on a trail and it won't go away, go around it. If you need to go off trail just a little bit so you can go around a snake and enjoy your time, there isn't a park ranger out there that's going to be mad at you about that. The most unnecessary, dangerous thing that you can do with a rattlesnake is interact with it. That could be kill it, catch it, anything like that. It's not going to make you more safe. It's not going to make anyone else more safe. Uh, it is purely self-indulgent in most cases and is not going to do anything to help your situation or anyone else's. So don't do it. Uh, rattlesnakes don't jump chase or pick fights. They can't jump through the air. They can't jump multiple times through the, through, through the air, through a strike in the same way that I can't punch so hard that I fly across the room. Uh, unless you are in the immediate area, roughly the same body length as the snake or one big step, you are safe unless you choose to make it not safe. If you are bitten though, and this does happen 200 times a year in the state, if you are one of the you know, a couple dozen of people that are accidentally bitten by a rattlesnake. I'm going to give you a list of things here, but there's one thing that you need to know. You call 911. That's it. You call 911 and do what they tell you to do. While they are, here's some of the things that they might tell you to do. Okay. And if they tell you to do something differently than I'm telling you to do right now, go with them. <laughs> Say what, do what they're doing to do, but call 911. Don't panic. Remember, zero deaths. You will live. Okay. You might want to remove some anything that's tight, jewelry, tight clothing, anything that's going to prevent swelling. There's going to be some swelling. It's going to hurt. 
uh, and follow the instructions of the emergency personnel. Uh, don't use any self uh, care things. Don't use anything you bought from the store. Don't use anything your grandpa told you to do or you learned in Cub Scouts. Doesn't work, can make the bite worse. Certainly do not uh, tie the bite off. That can make it much worse. Um, if your dog is bitten by a venomous snake, then they need to go to an emergency vet right away. And I'm not a vet, I'm not a doctor. So take any medical talk here that I'm giving with a big grain of rice, okay? Um, but a grain of salt, <laughs> grain of rice. Um, something about a lot of vets, especially with horses for some reason, and some dogs, they will wait to give antivenom and they'll use things that, um, that are not actually effective. So uh, a common one I see out there is to give Benadryl. Um, the uh, toxinologists that design modern snake bite protocols uh, advise against using Benadryl. And the reason for that is that it doesn't actually do anything to uh, prevent the swelling from a rattlesnake bite. Uh, the swelling from rattlesnake bite is not caused due to a histamine reaction like a bee sting or something. It is due to cell death and fluid buildup and that kind of thing. So Benadryl doesn't actually help with that. And uh, my understanding is also that by giving Benadryl in the field, it's not even buying more time. It can just mask other symptoms. So they might give an antihistamine as part of treatment at the hospital, but that doesn't mean that you taking children's Benadryl at home is going to help you in any way or help your dog in any way. Um, this one's always kind of interesting because it's protected folklore. Um, there are numerous groups on Nextdoor and on Facebook that you will get banned if you say that Benadryl doesn't cure or a snake bite or doesn't help a snake bite. It's kind of strange because it's kind of put out there like these folksy home remedies are going to fix, fix you up better than the big fancy city doctor. Uh, not realizing that Benadryl is produced by Johnson and Johnson, one of the largest pharmaceutical country, uh, companies in the world. So they're not really, you know, sticking it to the, to the man as much as they think they are, but yeah, take your dog to a vet, an emergency vet that will give anti-venom aggressively. That's how you save your dog. Um, if you're bitten, you're 10 miles away from the trailhead, call 911. You're going to be going for a helicopter ride. If you are in a place, and this is where, this is where, um, where a lot of uh, uh, these questions usually goes, well, what if I'm way out there and I don't have any access to cell phone apps? Use your satellite device, use your spot, your inner reach. And if you don't have one of those, then after this presentation is over, you can go get one. They're not expensive in the services, especially if you're in a place, if you go hiking a lot way off trail where no one's at, go get one. It could, it could save you. Uh, don't kill or capture the snake. You don't need to know what it is. The anti-venom that is available, there are two types that's, that are approved by the FDA. They are both polyvalent, which means it's made using the venoms from multiple types of snakes. Uh, the symptoms that can show up after a rattlesnake bite can vary greatly depending on the snake itself, the region it comes from, and the person and your reaction. Um, I would not, if I were going to the doctor and the doctor started treating me based on what they think the venom make it up is of the, the snake that they think it is, you know, remember, people are not good at identifying snakes and doctors are not necessarily good at it either. Um, I would I would ask for a different doctor, honestly, if that were happening. So there's no need um, to do that. And only a handful of doctors in the country that I would trust to meaningfully alter their um, their treatment based on a photo of the snake. Um, if you are a mouse, if any mice are watching this, ignore everything I said. You're in terrible danger. So the this is the last slide here. Okay. Um, I understand the fear of snakes. It can be a real thing. Fear is a real thing. And I, I do not like when um, people that are knowledgeable about snakes dismiss it very easily. And if that is something that has happened to you, I, I wish it hadn't. I'm sorry for that. Um, that's not the way that people that are on my side of things should be approaching those situations um, because fear is real. Even if the things that we're scared of, if the, if the danger itself is not um, logically present, it's not something that's there, but that fear is not going to be changed by just watching a presentation like this. Just learning some facts like this is not something that's going to change how you feel about them. But if you have information like this and you're willing to try to challenge how you feel about it, if you don't enjoy being scared of snakes, then these are things you can learn to try to, to bring that, bring that, uh, home. So where you don't have to feel that way anymore. The best thing you can do is to continue doing what you did today and learn as much as you can and start looking at pictures of snakes. And I would not be surprised if in a few years you actually enjoy seeing them. So I'm going to start looking at 
some of the questions here and see who we got. I'm going to go down to the Q&A and see if there's any that weren't addressed in here. Okay. Has the rain of last summer affected the growth rate of our snake population this year? Um, not the growth rate. What I would say is that it is possible that there is a higher survivorship. So after 2020, we had that really, really hot, dry uh, present, uh, that really you know, awful summer. We just didn't have a monsoon. We did not have any baby rattlesnakes on our hotline the next spring. They, most of them died. For this year, we see lots of baby rattlesnakes. I saw one last night. So yes, there are probably a, there's probably a higher population of, of overall rattlesnakes right now than there is than there was last year at this time. Um, just because more survived, um, but it doesn't mean that the population is growing. It's something that fluctuates with, um, you know, the resources available at the time. Okay, some of these I answered during the presentation. Let's see. I hike on South Mountain on a regular basis with my dog. Obviously, hiking at sunrise now as the weather warms is a safe time of day. To, is it a safe time of day to hike with respect to snakes? Uh, if you're hiking at sun up, then you're, you can start seeing more, more snakes. Right now, not so much, but as soon as the temperatures start to, to level out into the, the triple digits, then right at sunrise and the, the hours after that is when they're, you're going to be really active because they're going to be more nocturnal. So just keep an eye out. Um, and I didn't talk about this, but I'm not going to go into it too deeply. Uh, I would strongly advise getting uh, rattlesnake aversion training for your dogs and always, always having them on a leash when you're hiking. Dogs that are off leash, and this is according to surveys that we put out with veterinarians and other people that we work with that have been bitten by dog or that have dogs that have been bitten by snakes. A dog that is off leash when hiking is nine times more likely to be bitten by a rattlesnake than one that's on leash. They're bitten on the nose. They're not surprised by a snake. They're bitten when they go in to investigate. So uh, go ahead and hike in the morning, train your dogs, keep them on a leash. Okay. Some of these other ones I have answered. Do snakes climb plants or trees? Yes, they do. Uh, rattlesnakes do occasionally climb, um, climb trees. So they'll go up there occasionally to try to hunt birds, um, to access things. It's not something you really need to worry about though too much. I mean, they can do it, but you don't need to worry about rattlesnakes dropping out of trees on you or anything like that. Um, yeah. And any of these questions that are about, um, what to do if you're bitten, just try not to worry about the list too much. It is, uh, call 911. That's the one answer. And if you can't get, get access to 911, Prepare in advance so that you can get access. If you're way out in the middle of nowhere and you have no chance of getting a hold of anybody, a rattlesnake bite is no more deadly than a broken leg. Um, here's one here that is asking if snake gators are good. Yes, they can. They can be good. Um, they also protect against uh, cactus too. I wear them pretty often. Um, and do they rattle every time that they uh, strike? No. A lot of times they don't. The rattling is not, it's not a, a, an order of operations. If you step on a rattlesnake and it's in pain and it's hurting, it might bite you immediately. Um, think of it in the same way as like, what would it take for you to like hit somebody or hit a predator, right? You, you might want to try to, like I say, a dog is attacking you. You'd probably yell at the dog first, but if the dog just runs up and bites you, you're probably, you're probably punching the dog. You're not, you know, maybe yelling too, but yeah, there's no order. They can strike from a coil or not. Um, Maybe a little bit better or more targeted when they're in a coil, but they can strike from any position. They don't have to be rattling. Um, let's see here. If you see one on a hiking path, what are the chances of there being more in the area? It depends on the time of year. I would I would assume that there, there could be more. A lot of times they are drawn uh, to an area for social reasons. Uh, this time of year, there's often snakes, other snakes that may be with them for social reasons, mating, that kind of thing. Uh, social dominance type things, but other times of year, they may group up uh, because of the resources that are there. They may be there, uh, even if they're, it's not a social thing, just because that one particular cave is a really good one to be in. Uh, if you are an alien visiting earth, you might think that circle K in the morning is a very important building, a temple or something like that, because there's so many people in there, but we're not there because we're, we want to see people. We're there because we all need a cup of coffee and a donut. So snakes are kind of like that. So yeah, if you see one, it could mean something, but it doesn't indicate that there's more. They certainly don't travel in pairs like uh, I've heard the, the old cowboy rumors. Um, what do rattlesnakes eat? They eat primarily rodents. Some eat birds. Um, some also eat lizards. And when they're young, they might eat invertebrates. A rattlesnake's nocturnal. When it's really hot outside, then yeah, a lot of times. Once it's in triple digits, then they might start doing that. 
Uh, what is the lifespan of a rattlesnake? There's a rattlesnake that is being tracked. I, I think it's still alive. Uh, timber rattlesnake in the east that is in its 50s right now. We have one that is mostly uh, in its, it's probably in its, its late 30s that's here. Uh, in the wild, it's a different situation because, you know, humans are the only animal out there that, that has the opportunity someday to die in our sleep. Everything else eventually is ripped to shreds by something, unfortunately. And um, that is what, uh, you know, a snake, they're on the menu for everything. So a snake that has lived to be 15 years old or so in the wild might be an, an, considered an old snake. Um, and just, uh, there are some questions in here that are related to things that uh, my business does. Uh, forgive me, I'm going to decline to answer any of those things just because I like to keep these presentations very impartial and uh, just about the education part. Um, if you choose to contact me later, I could answer it, but I'm not going to do it in the, in the video. Um, see, what are the natural predators of rattlesnakes? I've heard that roadrunners and other birds. Yeah. Roadrunners eat baby rattlesnakes. Um, quite often. In fact, I, I see some adult rattlesnakes have star shaped scars on top of their head where a roadrunner tried to uh, eat them or kill them and maybe failed in the past. Uh, hawks, owls eat them, coyotes, bobcats, um, king snakes, coach whips, whip snakes, uh, skunks, you, you name tarantulas, toads. They are on the menu for all kinds of things. That is why they're so jumpy. It's because they absolutely should be. Once you get past that pointy part in the front, uh, there's just big, it's a three foot corn dog crawling around the desert. What does the rattle sound like? Give me a sec. Hello. If you can hear that. That's what the rattle sounds like. It's usually louder than you think. Should you circle the bite and write the time next to it? Yeah, you can do that. If you're bitten by rattlesnake, you can circle the, I mean, that would certainly be helpful uh, if, you, if you happen to, uh, to hike with a Sharpie. Okay, you can stop now, please. We have more questions. Are snakes attracted to water such as ponds and fountains? They are. Uh, they need to drink just like other animals. Um, they're also attracted to other things that drink too. So a pond or a fountain is not just a good place to get a drink. It's also a good place to lie in ambush to try to hunt things that might also want to get a drink too. So we see that quite a bit. So yeah, uh, having water sources around or hiking near water sources, especially in times when they're active, could increase the amount your likelihood of seeing a snake. Uh, do I have any thoughts on rattlesnake vaccines for dogs? The vet says it could help reduce the effects of snake bites. Uh, I'm not a vet, but I would say that if I had a dog, I would not give it to my dog um, because I have not seen sufficient evidence that it works at all. Uh, I have also seen um, instances where dogs have reacted to an, an allergic um, uh, reaction. A good idea. an allergic reaction to the bite um, as if it had been bitten before, even if um, that didn't happen. So I wouldn't give it to my dog. Also, I can't find any two vets that, um, that agree on it <laughs> either. So um, yeah, just, let me see here. One of my windows went away. There's the chat. I found it. Okay. Can I listen to headphones while hiking or am I just asking for it? Um, you can. It definitely makes it less safe. Um, one thing that might be interesting to try is the transparency mode. If you have the, the Apple ones, uh, the Air, AirPods Max or Pro that have that transparency mode that's basically a, a really active noise cancellation feature that that can even amplify sounds that are around you that could I might I might do some experimenting with that to see uh, if, if you can sense that because that'd be actually pretty good. Are they dangerous to our chickens? We had a king snake get into our chicken run once and worried about rattlesnakes. Yes. Um, so actually, it's kind of the other way around too. chickens will eat and kill rattlesnakes also. 
So, um, you know, it, it's not just the chickens that would be attracting snakes. It is the chicken coops attract rodents like crazy. So we do get a lot of snakes that are near um, chicken coops. So, um, you know, watch, watch out for that. Um, Catherine's asking, how high should a snake fence be? Um, a minimum of 30 inches high, 36 inches is preferred. I love your articles on king snakes and other snakes. Go for how they interact with rattlesnakes. What are your common myths with other snakes? Um, there's there's a tremendous amount of myths with with all kinds of all kinds of snakes here. But that is one of the big ones: is that bull snakes and gopher snakes eat rattlesnakes. Uh, they don't. It doesn't mean it hasn't happened. Um, you know, gopher snakes occasionally eat golf balls too. It doesn't mean that golf balls are going to go on the list of their of of their diet <laughs> of what what they actually eat. Um, when people have shown me, you know, when challenged on it and they say, well, I've seen gopher snakes eat rattlesnakes and they show a picture of it, it's always a coach whip. And there's also a lot of people that don't know the difference between a king snake and a gopher snake, or they see a desert king snake and doesn't look like the king snake they've seen on TV or their pet king snake. So yeah, gopher snakes don't actually eat rattlesnakes. What boots can be worn to protect against snake bites or snake, do snake leggings work? Yeah, uh, the type that I wear are called turtle skins. They're a little pricey, but they are very comfortable and lightweight. Uh, I also am currently wearing a tall leather boots, 10 inch called Kenetrack. Um, but snake bites can, um, or snake boots can be pretty effective. Um, or if you get any kind of boot that has, that's thick, a leather boot that has insulation uh, to it just to give extra um, room in there. A lot of times the fangs are going to put that venom on the first surface that it comes in contact with. So if you have boots on and then heavy pants that are kind of loose fitting, you, you really increase your, your chances of the venom being expelled on the pants itself, the material itself, and not uh, inside your leg. What is something homeowners can do to prevent snake dangers to their animals? The first and biggest one is um, training, get your dogs trained, contact somebody that does that. Uh, my business does not do that, but there's lots of places that do aversion training. Um, and then do everything you can to cut down the likelihood of having a rattlesnake on your property. You know, there's lots of different ways you can do that. The best one is to look at habitat reduction, changing your landscaping, making those kind of decisions. Uh, there's a lot of information online about how to make your, your yard less attractive to rattlesnakes. I would check that out. Do snakes swim rivers, streams, ponds? Yes, they do. Uh, every year there's a rattlesnake uh, swimming across Lake Pleasant, and every year there's a person losing their mind over that fact. They do cross waterways to get from one place to another, just like a lot of animals. Um, this can also give rise to mythology about them uh, chasing uh, boats and trying to attack boats. They're not trying to attack boats. They're trying to get out of the water because they don't know what a boat is, and they see this big floating thing, and they just want to rest. So that's what's happening there. What is the home range of rattlesnakes? Is there one in my front yard? Is it probably living there? It could be just passing through. Um, if you have an adult rattlesnake in your front yard, it is most likely um, part of its home range and it has most likely also been visiting there um, for, for years, for a long time. It is a, a, a common spot that it has visited. So that is one of the hardest things as homeowners to realize is that when you see a snake in your yard, it is not a new danger. If you go inside and then come back out and the snake is gone, your yard is not more dangerous than it was the day before. You just happen to see this one little slice of life that you normally don't miss. Um, if you keep seeing a snake and, and, or snakes near a particular bush, someone told me this this morning is that they saw a, a snake and then it, it you know, left. And then a year later, they saw a snake and it was under the same bush. So it was the same snake. Most likely, you know, the lesson there is not the snake. It is the bush. That bush is the thing that you need to get rid of. So if you are worried about a place that a snake is visiting, change the landscape if you can. Remove that resources if you can. And the snake is going to want to keep um, going. Is it possible to really snake proof your yard with snake fencing? Yes, if it is done properly. There's lots of ways you can, you can mess that up. Uh, so make sure that, you know, it's not a do-it-yourself kind of job. Um, why do I keep so many snakes and is it legal? Yes, it is legal. I have a permit called a wildlife handling permit, a wildlife holding permit that allows me to keep uh, rattlesnakes for this purpose. I do a lot of education work with them. So, uh, I gave a version of this presentation first thing this morning to a group of realtors and I brought, um, here's one of the rattlesnakes I brought with me right here, put them in display boxes and I bring them to these places so that people can learn about rattlesnakes. We also have some that we um, breed for conservation purposes, all kinds of things that we do with, with these animals to, to affect 
presentations and media like this. Um, so uh, yeah, you can't, I have, I have Gila monsters. You can't just go have a Gila monster. You have to have a permit and a lot of other stuff. Let's see. I had a baby snake cruise by me one day when I was on my concrete deck. It was walking. I, it was walking on the lower tip of its tail. Its whole body was in the air. Why did they do this? I'm having a hard time visualizing the way that that was, that was described. So um, maybe email me a little more than that. I don't understand it. Um, the rattlesnake in the video loop, that last one where the snake was eating the feathers. Do they typically eat prey that big? I never realized how it might be for them to eat something without hands. So that particular snake was eating um, a, a group of feathers that had fallen on the ground. We think from um, that had, it was, a, it was a, a kill site from another animal. There was other parts of that bird that was there too. So the snake found a free meal and was trying to eat it. So um, yeah, rattlesnakes can, just like other snakes, they can eat prey that is larger than uh, their head by, um, they can stretch their, their lower jaw apart in the front and slowly swallow something whole. So um, they have a way to do it. Any advice for horseback riders? Um, that one's tricky because, you know, a lot of times when you, it depends on the way your horse reacts to snakes. And I don't know, I don't know a whole lot about um, horse training or the way that works, but I would say, um, you know, just do what you can to remain aware. And if it's possible to, to, um, to train horse, I'm not really sure. Don't have a, a really satisfactory answer for that. I would say that the uh, the old tried and true uh, start you know start shooting at the snake is not is not going to make anything better. If that were the case, um, I was yeah. Anything you can do to um, increase awareness or increase visibility for how for horses that you keep for horse properties, there's a lot you can do there. One of the biggest ones you can do is just to make sure to rotate out your feed so you don't have that layer of. I, sometimes I go to a property and see there's like a foot of. They just get the new stuff and put it on top of the old stuff and it's full of mice. Don't do that. Um, another thing you can do is at where the, the run is, where the pen is or the, the corral, cut the brush back six feet on the other side of it because snakes hunt in those transition zones. So you're essentially moving the transition zone outside of where the horse is going to interact with it. And you can, you can help that way and just keep it as, as uh, rodent free as possible. So if you're, if you want to get rid of snakes on your horse property, don't worry about shooting snakes, shoot at rodents, get rid of the rodents. That's the only reason that they are there. They don't, not there for the horses. Do I have a snake aversion trainer for dogs that I recommend? Um, uh, I will, I will say when this, we are not affiliated with them. They're not, uh, I don't make any money by saying this. Uh, the one that I like the most is called rattlesnake ready. Uh, they're out of cave Creek. They are pretty busy. They're booked out really far, but that's also because it's really prime rattlesnake season around. There's other ones as well. Uh, that do this. Um, I would say if when you we're looking for someone that does dog training with um, rattlesnakes, um, it's important to that they treat the snakes well as well. I know that might not seem like a big factor, but you know there are, there are some there are some dog training companies that I see that are always looking for new snakes for some reason. It's because that you know they the snakes in their care die, and there's other ones that don't. They have the same snakes, so um, pick pick a good one. Uh, are snakes deaf and they can, can they hear high pitched sounds? Um, there is some evidence that rattlesnakes can detect airborne sounds to some degree, whether or not, or to what extent they use that to alter their behavior uh, is another matter and kind of open, open for debate. Um, but yep, they might be able to hear you. They might be able to, but it's not going to be in the same way that, uh, that we do. So it's not quite true. Absolutely. That they are deaf. But to um, say that they are uh, meaningfully impacted by uh, sounds um, also isn't necessarily true. Um, I have heard that you cannot move or relocate a snake more than a mile. It only has a 50% chance of survival, correct? It is not correct. Um, so there's a, this is a really long topic, so I won't go into it too much. Uh, and if you want to know the details of it, you can please email me. I'll, I'll be happy to talk your ear off about it. Um, but the comparison of the studies that have been done in the past of snakes that are translocated from one place to another um, does not accurately emulate the situation that is actually present here in the city, where the snake has an option to remain in place versus being moved. This is 
you know, the difference between moving one from its preferred habitat or one that was found in the Safeway parking lot. Those are different, different, you know, that's a different control that, that wasn't really done. And there's been a lot of improvements made to methods, uh, things like being careful about microhabitat selection, uh, looking at uh, stressors uh, being more in line with the natural history and uh, needs of that particular animal. And that 50% survival rate, even if it's done without those considerations, starts looking pretty good, considering that being having your head cut off with a shovel is 100% death rate. So 50% is, you know, it's a like glass half full, uh, especially if you can make that glass more full by improving that technique. Um, and a study was just published about a month ago that showed that snakes that are relocated further away to entirely without of their home range, and some of those factors were kept in mind, suffered no loss. They had no difference in outcomes than snakes that were just moved to the other side of the fence. So uh, the short answer is it's not true. Snakes can be relocated, but it has to be done right. It can't be just, you know, relocation of a snake is not just putting a snake in a bucket and putting it in the desert. It's very specific work that, um, I, you know, I, I appreciate that there's a lot of goodwill out there and people want to release them, but it is not such that, uh, that I, I think can be sufficiently done without a, a fairly deep knowledge of, of the animals. All right, let's see if I have any more of those. How often should a dog receive snake aversion training? Um, I'm not sure. I would ask the, the trainer. I've heard every few years could use refresher. I would say don't test it yourself too. I know that that's the thing that they would say is if you, you know, if you have the training, don't like show your dog a snake to see if it works. All right, I'm going to go look in YouTube and see if there's anything else there. But other than that, I think we have probably answered everything. And, uh, Gosh, it's been almost two hours too. I've probably been keeping you long enough. Do rattlesnakes have this egg stench? No, they don't. Uh, rattlesnakes don't smell bad. Um, they don't smell like cucumbers either. <laughs> That's something I've heard occasionally. Do rattlesnakes always rattle their tails as a warning? No, they don't. Uh, a lot of times, most of the time, they're going to stay hidden as I explained. What was the first rattlesnake I ever found in the wild and what got me into herping? Uh, it was a great basin rattlesnake in Idaho when I was fishing when I was a kid. That was the first rattlesnake I saw. Um, but I think, you know, the same as anyone else that does this now. I think it starts with reading books about dinosaurs and learning that dinosaurs are all dead and what's there are reptiles and snakes are, are interesting things. You know, kids like reptiles, kids like bugs, kids, kids like that stuff. And um, I was very fortunate that my parents didn't talk me out of that, that um, it never became a thing to outgrow or be weird to be interested in a natural world. So I, I have a daughter, I'm certainly, you know, I'm not gonna make her like snakes. That's, if she wants to, then she can do that. Um, but uh, yeah, if, if you have a kid and they're not scared of snakes and you're scared of snakes, um, you can certainly teach them to be scared of snakes. So don't, don't do that to them, but yeah, I think, Andre, I think our, our paths are probably pretty, pretty similar as a lot of people that are herpers. So anything I'd recommend as an effective repellent for homes? I wish I could. Uh, there isn't anything. There are no repellents. We have some plans to start testing some things. It is my hope that we can find something that is a commercially available uh, chemical or product or something that we could recommend as a way to do that. Uh, but currently there is nothing that is going to do that. So we'll let you know. Um, rattlesnakes were tangled to each other. One was leading and one was trailing. It smelled like chocolate milk. What are they doing? Okay. Um, so what you're describing sounds like you saw two snakes that were mating and they became, since one was dragging the other, they became very stressed. Um, to the point where one of them may have musked. So if you pick up a snake, uh, sometimes they'll expel a gross secretion out of the cloaca that smells really bad. It's not something they just do. It's something that happens if they're being attacked or handled. Um, after my presentation this morning, I was driving home, saw a gopher snake in the road by my house. I picked it up to move it off the road. It pooped all over me. So if that's all these descriptions of eggs and chocolate milk, I, I guess snake musk could be that, yeah, but yeah. Uh, how far do most rattlesnakes travel? It really depends on the home range, depends on the resources in the area. It could be miles, it could be feet, you know? So the answer is exactly how long, how much distance they need to travel to get to the, the things that they need. 
similar to where if you're out in the middle of nowhere, if you live in the country, you have to travel longer to go to the grocery store than you live in town. And what is the rarest rattlesnake in the Southwest? I mean, this might be the last question I answer unless there's one other thing in chat, but um, the rarest rattlesnake in the Southwest is called the New Mexico ridge-nosed rattlesnake, Crotalus willardii obscurus. They are found in only two mountain ranges in the United States, the Palencio Mountains in Arizona and New Mexico. They are on the border there in the Animas Mountains in New Mexico. In the Palencios, they are greatly imperiled uh, and on probably going to be extirpated at some point here due to climate change. Um, and on in the animus, it's a higher range. So there is still a good population there, but the outlook for the entire thing is probably not, uh, not that great, but very difficult to see. It's also a federally endangered species. So it's not even legal to, to look for them. Okay, I think, I think that's it. I might miss a couple of questions. If I miss someone's questions, please email me. I'd be happy to, to, uh, to answer it for you. But uh, yeah, it's been just, just shy of two hours. I really appreciate everybody taking some time uh, on, a, on a Monday night to learn about something that you may hate. Um, hopefully you feel a little better about it. Hopefully we answered your questions and, um, and enjoy your hikes. You don't have to stay home. 